What's up, everyone, and welcome back to part two of the podcast with Scott Hayward. I'm your host, Val Medved, with John Gray, and today we'll wrap up the second part of the podcast with Mr. Hayward. Before his tenure at Alpine Helicopters, Scott served as the chief engineer at Wildcat Helicopters and held key roles at Heavy Lift Inc. and Helifix Limited in Papua New Guinea, where he managed maintenance scheduling, introduced new aircraft types, and passed rigorous audits with flying colors. Today, we'll get into Scott's journey, his insights on aviation maintenance, and the innovative strategies he implemented to drive success in a dynamic industry. Whether you're an aviation enthusiast, maintenance professional, or a leader looking for inspiration, this episode is packed with valuable takeaways. So without further ado, and if you're sitting at home or letting this play in your earbuds while you're at work, let's welcome the man who keeps helicopters flying high, Scott Hayward. This is Vertical MRO. Special thanks to our sponsors for this podcast, Bell, Safe Structure Designs, and Precision Aviation Group. Welcome to the Vertical MRO Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. All right, everyone, uh, you're at our contact, you're cleared to the Bravo. The Vertical MRO Podcast explores the fascinating world of helicopter maintenance, repair, and overhaul with your host, Val Medved. Now line out 3029, approved as requested. The podcast features helicopter technicians, mechanics, engineers, and MRO experts who share invaluable industry insight knowledge, and stories that will inspire current and aspiring industry maintainers. Well, and it's, it goes right back to kind of, we, we've, we've touched the subject a whole bunch in the past, and I think this is kind of a general common theme now, the tribal knowledge that guys like Scott and his team possess and kind of having, like, there's there's got to be something that kind of creates that pass down of that knowledge. And I guess AI is just the way it's going to happen or you enter that data and all of a sudden it's going to get logged and it's going to be, you know, there's going to be some type of algorithm where it kind of identifies particular problems and it'll come up with solutions in seconds, never mind, you know, having to kind of trail hunt something there. I'm, I'm going backwards on it. So it's, it's, yeah. You know, we, we're, an, we're an ATO in Canada here. We, we have type, we got type certificate training. We can give you that's internationally registered, recognized. And uh, we have an instructor and that instructor, he's 40 years old. He's super keen. He's one of our AMEs. And one of the things we ask them to do is uh, every three years, you're required to do update training. We do it virtually every six months and online PowerPoint, and we do it in person every six months. And that every six months is where that knowledge is passed down. It's not an instructor standing up. We have slides to talk about. Let's, and we have things, you know, parts to pass around. Hey, if he did this, this happened. And it's about engaging people because everybody's got a different perspective of how that happened mm. and having that open dialogue. And it's good. Like every time we have a maintenance session like that, we book an hour or two hours for it. And we always run over. Yeah. Always. So you have a visual and physical educational session. Well done. Yeah. And then so last year we started the process in there. We're bringing in outside speakers just so it's not... Um, the same people talking. We had uh, Saffron out last year. We got Pratt and Whitney coming in this year. And uh, just give a little bit of, hey, ask these guys some of these questions. You've been doing it this way, and this is a knowledge, but why is it happening? Like, whoa, and take us through that. And uh, they're more than happy to participate, eh? You know, that's, Scott, that, that, that is like, I don't, and you know what? My wife's in education. She always says, and she's told me this for like 20 something years now, when you generally, when you physically have something that you can look at and learn that way and physically touch that, and kind of get an idea and get a perspective of all your kind of your 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 peers around you. Yeah, that's the best way to learn it. So good good for you for kind of good for you guys for practicing that. That's uh, that's key when it comes to kind of root cause problems. So last year we, we went a step further with our CRM program. We took an uh, incident we had uh, a maintenance incident, and uh, we had open discussion with the pilots and engineers in the same room to discuss how we could have all stepped up to stop this to happen. Well, what was the breakdown? You know, how did the cheese line up? Because it's just not a maintenance issue. It's a piloting issue as well, accepting the aircraft. And, Human factors. Yeah. And uh, how, how do you do that? And and to be honest, I think talking about that stuff openly is, it's great. It's going to make everybody a bit more aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point in, in law enforcement. After a critical incident, we always debrief it as a group. Yeah. So you, you take that concept and you apply it like you guys did to a mishap. And then as a group, debrief that because at the end of the day, we all want to get better, right? Yeah. We all are trying to, to do our jobs better, whether you're a, a pilot, a maintainer, it doesn't matter what your role is. We're all, we're all necessary for the successful completion of that mission. Can you talk about that mission or not, what happened a little bit and how that 
debrief may have helped kind of the next thing? Yeah, I, I can talk about it without saying too much. Is we had some uh, organizational norms and including uh, outside vendors and how we dealt with them and how, how we would tag parts and how they would come in and come out. It wasn't industry standard, but it had been done that same way for, you know, 30 years without an incident. And what we did is, well, people retired and people moved on and things were missed. Mm. And so where we, we thought this part was good to go, it was all certain. Well, actually it wasn't. And things that we had expected to be completed after the overhaul process, well, they were never asked to do it. It wasn't in the work scope. So it's not their fault, you know? And um, it, was, it was assumed. It was assumed. And, and those assumptions, because the system's been working for so long, you're like, yeah, there's no errors in the system. Well, you know what? That system relies on people. and People move on. And uh, so, we, yeah, we had to take a real serious look at how we're doing those type of items, how we're accepting that through our quality program and letting that part to the field. I was always told that, you know, the, the worst thing about it, when you assume things, it makes an ass out of you and me. Oh, you, you know what? And, and I've been with this company, like I said, for five years, and uh, it had been done this way without incident. So I'm pretty hesitant to change something when you've had zero incidents. You, you know, got a track record, right? You got a track record. You a can... proven track record, but it was pretty scary. So when we saw this and we talked to the, the tech who put it on, to the pilot who found it and everything, and every, everybody took a step back and it was like, okay, hey, we got to relook at this and see. Get the 10,000 foot view instead of the one foot view. Yeah. What I, what I really like about what we're doing with this podcast is Val brought trouble knowledge, you know, and you talk about how when somebody retires, you lose, you lose that institutional memory and knowledge that person's gained over the course of their career. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we're trying to do is take these stories like you just brought up and share those so that other people might, might find themselves in a situation like, hey, I'm doing this because it's what we've always done. And, and I think everybody's guilty of that. You know, you kind of find yourself in a rhythm and you do the job in a way that's standard because it's always been set that way and it's like well it's probably like that for a reason it's really hard to look inwardly and figure out why are we doing that but your your story really highlights the need to look at some of these things and be like well is there a better way to do it and if there is how so i give you guys a lot of credit for looking inwardly to, to identify that and, and build from that so since that incident we you know we had, we had a lot of aircraft a lot of things going on if i see something that maybe could be systemic um, or uh, something like that. I have our SMS uh, investigator do a full investigation and, and really dig into it. Do, do we have an issue or is it, a, you know, or do we not? And, mm -hmm. and try and address them. He's really good. He digs into them and uh, good report. And the reports are really accepted well by the guys. And that justifies a reason why we're going to change a process. Yeah. Being completely transparent to the whole thing is really important to the guys and girls. Right. There's something that comes to mind as we talk through this that, that pops up is we talk about like parts and tools tracking. When you're at the hangar, it's like being home. When I get home, I have a particular place to put my wallet, a particular place to put my keys. And if I'm not home, I'm at a friend's house and I drop my stuff. I'm like, it's, I'm out of my norm. So I imagine the same thing happens at the hangar. Like when you're at the hangar, you, you know where all your parts are. You know where all your tools are. How do you, when you go to the bush or remote areas, how do you keep track of that stuff do you have advice for people that might find themselves in a position where they're not tasked with coming up with a system to keep track of this stuff? almost like an inventory count on on departure thank you to our sponsor bell bell proudly supports the vertical mro podcast and their vision to share valuable insights into helicopter maintenance repair and overhaul Bell is dedicated to keeping our customers in the sky and on their missions with industry-leading global customer solutions. You know, I, I've seen it on both extremes. I was working next to the Australian Defense Force and they had a couple Blackhawks there. And there's one guy working and he was tool tagging his own tools out. And I was like, well, that's next level. Like you're by yourself. And I, I, to tell you the truth, I think... There's, I can't tell somebody how to do it. You have to have your own system that works for you because everybody works differently. But the one thing I do, or I've always told everybody as well, is when you do maintenance at night, finish your work, do all your work, do your inventory of your stuff, all your tools, go home, come back out in the morning, get four hours sleep, and relook at your work in daylight. If you get, you'll get a totally different perspective. Do your inventory. And then when your pilot shows up, tell them what you did. Mm. walk him through that maintenance and if he doesn't want to know 
tell him again. It's uh, your team out there, and you have yeah. to rely on him. And um, when it's just the two of you in the middle of nowhere, yeah. two or three of you in the middle of nowhere, you should probably kind of that's that's a good safety check for everybody to perform. So when I was heli skiing years ago, I had some younger guys with me, and this had been taught for me from the guys above me is you should never be caught out with your maintenance. Every day when that helicopter lands, you know you're going to have to do a 25-hour. Your filter should be pulled. Your, your O-rings should be pulled. Everything should be laid out, even written on the packages, where those O-rings are going. In the event that there's something irregular with the aircraft that's outside the norm, you can tackle it and not be overwhelmed with middle of the night trying to pull parts and stuff. And, and that pre-planning takes the chaos away from it. Yeah. And um, I, I struggled at those times to write that logbook entry in the middle of the night. So one of the other guys I was working with, he opened his, his little notepad. He had all this inspections pre-written. So when he's tired, he, he, he could reference them. So he didn't get caught up in some wordage or language that would get him um, in trouble with a QA office. Yeah. That's smart. Ounce, ounce of prevention prevents a pound of pain, right? So Yeah. I don't think as an engineer, you should ever be caught out. It's your job to, to be ahead and be a professional. And things happen. I get it. I've been there where they snowball. But if if you can be prepared for your tour every time, you're going to do a great job. Good piece of advice. Yeah. Hey, talk, talk about the accident chain. And that's one of those links you could easily break by a little bit of prevention with what you're talking about. You know, so that's really good advice. One thing we give our guys, uh, tell them to do is when they come on tour... Even if they haven't been flying, the technical dispatch for the aircraft, write a new one. Learn your aircraft. Feel it. Know where it is. You know, where where is it in its, its inspection and its life cycle? So you can update that. But then, oh, hey, he's starting to fly a little bit. I, I got a 25-hour. I got a retort coming up. I got this coming up. Do I have that Thule? You already know what's happening. This, this is a common thing along conversations that we've been having in the past year about the accountability. Yeah. <clears throat> and once you kind of put the accountability to the particular engineer and the aircraft, and have them understand it, like make it a part of their every day. That's that's a that's a that's a that's a passionate step. And there's yet another word where you know AMEs, DOMs, PRMs, us sales guys, pilots, we're, we all we're passionate about this particular industry. And when you kind of involve yourself to that that level of uh, of operations on an aircraft and the and the task and the mission, yeah, you're right. The, the outcome the outcome is a positive one when everyone's that vested into it. Yeah. It is a t- tad bit of a segue, John, but I was probably in well, about four years into being licensed, I was becoming a pilot hater. I was one of those crusty guys. I'd been around enough people, and it was sleeting out. It was miserable, and the machine came back. And the, and the pilot, I kind of gave him a gruff time. and He put his helmet down came back. So, so I gave him a hard time about going to the hot tub. You know, there's girls there, and I'm going to be working on the machine. And He said, you know what? You wanted to be an engineer? Be a professional. I want to be a pilot. I'm a professional. And I respect him. And, and from that day, man, that bothered me. Hmm. And I changed that day. I was like, yeah, I am a professional at my job. Why am I bitching? Like, I'm here to do my job. Yeah. And, and it was just a different perspective. Yeah. It's, it, it's a good, good point. And I think there's, I think all of us at some point have been confronted with something like that, right? That changes your perspective for the, for the betterment. Yep. And uh, going to what you're talking about, I, I like to hear that. You know, he addressed the, the situation and, and, you know, hopefully that built uh, a, a better relationship and understanding between you and, and him and then your relationship with, with pilots, you know, down the road. So I've always had really good experiences with uh, the, the mechanics, AMPs, IAs that I work with or did work with. And that was important. We worked in a small house. We had, we had two mechanics uh, for three ships and law enforcement. And uh, they would come fly with us after their, their maintenance cycles and, it was just a really good relationship we had. And I think it was vital to the overall success of our missions to have that relationship. Can you talk about how that kind of culture can build itself? Yeah, I'll tell you, my career changed when I changed my attitude. That Pilots were more open to me. They're like, hey, this is going on with the aircraft. I became part of a team when there were good jobs, good opportunities coming up. Hey, we want Scott to come up because of this or because of that. And, uh, it became a very positive experience, very positive. And uh, yeah, if you choose whatever you choose to do, do the best at that. Yeah, and, and be part of that team. And I know you personally from this, but I want you to kind of just kind of just snapshot that as a little bit as a director of maintenance now, kind of having that same attitude as a DOM 
to your pilots and your AMEs now are you, it's, is a cultural thing that you've kind of showed them things get things get done in a better way when we're all kind of on the same page have you instilled that into your into your engineers and your pilots today you, you know at all i'll be honest i've been there for five years and this company's been around for 65 years mm. my five years is just a blip on the radar yeah and uh and there's people there like a fellow just retired with a 47 year tenure as an ame there wow and, and incredible tenure like I, I am asking him questions. You know what I mean? There, yeah. there, there's an incredible wealth of knowledge there. And uh, and the guys are good there. They, they all hang out together. They don't need that. They're, they're It's not that environment. But I do talk to the young guys that we have coming on. We have a huge apprenticeship program that we've just spearheaded last year. And those apprentices coming in, it's important for them not to grow up being, I call them pilot haters. We all know who they are and they're in the industry. But you got to be a team. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise it's it becomes a toxic culture. Yep. And you do, looking at the accident chain, it's really easy for that thing to, to grow because of the lack of communication when you're in a bad cultural yep. environment. Talking is is crucial, and those relationships, if it's a good one, are going to lend to that right that that open source of communication. So I, I love that you're kind of promoting that and and following that culture. That, that's great. You know, I'm trying to. And it, it's up to the people to whether they want to take that on or not. But I right. think it, I think once that type of culture gets momentum, if you're not part of that, you get furloughed to the side. Yeah, you, you eliminate a lot of it because you're. It's it's kind of like the as as much as we all kind of know this about it, it's kind of the unspoken thing about pilots versus engineers. I I get it. I understand. I've seen it. But good for you for kind of taking it on, saying, "Listen, if you're gonna like, you're working with these people for eight, ten, twelve hours a day." And kind of if you should probably get to learn to like them a little bit, because then life becomes a little bit easier for you. And it's almost like a family atmosphere for, like you said, if that guy's been around and he's an, and he was an AME for 47 years, kudos to him for him kind of sticking around and being, being that good of an expert there. And like you said, that good of a professional and kind of working and answering even the DOMs and PRMs questions. Right. So good, good on that. Yeah. It was interesting. We retired. He, 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 he should, he probably should have retired a year ago, but he goes, I want to make it to 70. Oh boy. I'm like, good on you. That like, yeah. he still rat rode his pedal bike to work every day. And wow. He was still fit and, I, mm. I, and had a great attitude. To, it's something to aspire to, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's fantastic, dude. And well, well, and that, that just shows a culture. Like when you say, when you're bringing in these young guys and a lot of, a lot of younger AMEs think they can kind of go, go take on the world and kind of do it by themselves and try to, you know, kind of go about it and, and figure out the problems by themselves. But there it's, the, the, again, it's, it's, it's the hot work of the hot word of the day. We talk about the tribal knowledge that's handed down from directors of maintenance, even some of the people that's been up front in the office there for a long time and kind of get a bit of a, uh, cultural snapshot of what the company is and who, you know, how long they've been doing it for 65 years. And a guy like you, who's been abroad for more than a few years and you kind of got the different, you know, aircraft that you have underneath your belt. So it's, it's just the word of the wise to the young guys is just like tap into the knowledge that's around you. Yeah. You know what? One thing that we've done is we opened up a 24 hour AOG line. I call it a maintenance line for intermediates and for mediums. And it's manned by somebody. Somebody's always on call a senior person. Cause quite often when you, you just need to talk it out. Where, where am I? How I got this going on. And then every time I'm there, I always ask the pilot to come on. Because the pilot's got a different perspective of that torque event or how it happened. And uh, and as a group, you can normally work through it pretty quickly. Hmm. Different eyes. Yeah. Right. And just talking about it out loud changes it as well. Yeah. 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 There's there's so many times when you start talking to somebody and the moment you verbalize whatever your question was, you come up with your own solution. But it took right. you verbalizing it to come up with that solution, which yeah. is funny, you know. Yep. I think that's called therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what i mean like it's listen we're, we're we're all trying to be you know we're all trying to be our professionals in our own world but in the minute that you kind of like if you're cornholed into thinking that you kind of like you, you're you're stuck but meanwhile you just if you just talk about it to someone else you usually kind of come up with the answers within the conversation and it's just a matter like you say just airing it out and having another person's opinion kind of get yeah. back to you on that or if it's in a group then it's, then it's even better because now you have more ears and more solutions yeah, so there's three guys who man the intermediate or the medium line, and Bert's one of them. He's a wealth of knowledge, you know, and, <laughs> and he, he can fix anything on that medium. He can. Birdie's good people. Birdie's good people. And uh, 
And then, and then on the medium, on the medium or the intermediate line, there's a, some guys with some huge depths of knowledge and you can't replace that. Yep. Yeah. And they're happy to pass it on. Little side note there, John Burt. I'm pretty sure he has a hollow leg. So <laughs> the man can hold his own. He always challenges me every time. Every time he sees me, he always wants to challenge me to drink off. I'm like, no, dude, my liver. I, I, I was always, I was, I was on the precipice of getting a liver transplant, sitting in there drinking with you last time. So no, uh, we're. <laughs> We're gonna, we're just gonna I don't sit think this he one. challenged you. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> you may have taken on Muhammad Ali yourself there. <laughs> wow. Can't be George Foreman without Muhammad Ali, right? So, <laughs> yeah, for it's good people. So that's it. And, and I guess in, in essence of all of this, you just got to surround yourself with the positive individuals that can basically want to learn and kind of have that team culture. So it's it's and I know it's not an easy task sometimes because. Listen, in our industry, we have particular type personalities where sometimes that that's a lot to ask for, but I'm hoping this next generation of AMEs and DOMs that are listening to this, they kind of have that understanding that this is, you're only as good as your weakest link. Yeah. You know, I went through um, Northern Lights, SAIT, um, and it did the huge interviews. There's a whole bunch of us when did this. It's pretty positive seeing the kids coming out of school. They They're excited. They want to get into it, you know, and they, mm -hmm. they're looking to get into helicopters. They want to go to those remote camps. They they're excited to do it. It's good to see. Yeah, good. On that, I we talk about recruitment quite a quite a bit and retention as well. Yeah, and I think every part of of our industry is suffering on the recruitment side. Have you seen any any interesting and effective tools as far as recruitment goes that you, would be worth kind of sharing? Thank you to our sponsors, Safe Structure Designs. Safe Structure Designs specializes in custom aircraft maintenance stands and hangar equipment, boosting hangar efficiency by 50% and enhancing technician safety. With over 20 years of experience alongside real-world aircraft technicians, SAFE develops industry-leading ergonomic safety solutions. Why not take advantage of SAFE's free custom design process for your safety and efficiency needs and let them create your ideal solution? Visit www.safe-2.com to learn more. You know, it, it, right now in today's industry, it's a tough industry to recruit people. Like where we are at all our bases, right now in Kelowna, you can't buy a house for under a million dollars. Both. So as an engineer, if you got a stay-at-home mom with a wife, you, you don't qualify for a mortgage. So how do you move here? Right. Um, so I, I think what you're seeing is the workforce diversified and people aren't looking for money. People are looking for work-life balance. Yeah, and however you can provide that because everybody's a bit unique how they want that, and that's a big shift for us. We we're ninety seven percent full time local employees, but I have great engineers, super skilled guys. You know, they're thirty seven years old. They want to come on board, but we can't bring them because they have to move to Cloner or Canmore. You know, nobody has a spare million dollars. Yeah, right. Yeah, cost cost of living is is a part of the big problem right now. Yeah. So what we, we have to look at it a way to shift our culture from the way it was with all the full-time people to integrating some touring people. And that's a tough thing. It is. And and every company is a bit unique how they do it. We have we attract a lot of people because they want to heli ski. So as an engineer, when you're heli ski, quite often if, if a guest is sick, you sit, you get to go in that seat that day. Or say somebody's on a five-day package and they're tired. So there's lots of engineers, you know, getting 14, 15 days of heli skiing a year. Oh, that's awesome. And champ like in chance there'd be like champagne powder, right? So champagne powder. And when you go heli skiing, uh for, with us at Alpine and CMH, you really get looked after. You you're you're not the hired help. You dine with the guests. So you can have a five star dinner every night. Wow. And you know, there's hot tubs, massage. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's keep this PG, please. <laughs> uh, I'm serious. Like it is a great work environment. It really is. They have heli yeah. shacks. Yeah. drying our covers and you know you have to work don't get me wrong but it's a really fun atmosphere you're at the top of most of the world too at that altitude too so it's 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 the, the your your panoramic view is is like you say 14 days of holy crap yeah and and we find that 14 days like we do a 14 and 14 in the winter that's enough a guy's cooked by that point yeah especially the pilots yeah yeah 
That's a lot of up and downs. Yeah. A lot of up and downs. I don't think there's any secret for recruitment except growing your own. Go into the schools. Okay. We have 10 apprentices right now. 10. And that's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we're, we're invested in them. We're invested are you finding, in them. Are you, are you finding them kind of like you say, they're, they're excited, but once they kind of get into the grind of it all, they're like, is there a, is, is that a holy crap moment where they're like, you know, oh man, is this, is this, is, is this right for me? And do they, but did, then an old an elder statesman like yourself comes in and says, Hey, listen, this is just a part of the growing process. Are you seeing more of that with the executive? Yeah, what we do with them, Mel, is we take them, and when they come out of school, they come to us, and it's two and a half year apprenticeship. By their last year of their apprenticeship, they're they're going to the lodges, they're doing kind of some filling underneath somebody, doing mentoring. They're going out to the field driving parts. Anytime they drive parts, we say we need want you to stay, help change the part, get the aircraft serviceable, even if it's two three days. Learn 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 how to do that, how to interact with the pilot. So the day you're licensed, you're ready to rock and roll. We've already nice. put a type course into you. We've invested in you. It's better to front load those people than wait, drag them on. Yeah. yeah. Not those people. I shouldn't say that. The apprentices. <laughs> <laughs> and every, every apprentice is different. They're not all ready at the same time. Right. They all take it in differently. And in their knowledge, we had some apprentices and they're really good people, but they came up during COVID. Well, we weren't flying as much. And you can tell by their skill set, it's not no, no, it's not their fault, but they didn't get to strobe twenty two helicopters. They got to strobe five, right? Hey, it, it John, was, you remember a conversation a couple of episodes ago when they they were hiring uh, young AMEs, and they're like, "Is there any work from home opportunities?" I'm like, "You're an AME, dude. There's no <laughs> such. You can't work from home and be an AME. Come on, man." <laughs> yeah. Wild. No, they're chomping to get to the bit. Last winter, we uh, we had some support helicopters out flying, supporting the 212, and uh, we sent an apprentice to crew those. Mm. Learn how to put those covers on. Learn how to preheat it. Learn how to talk to the pilot when he lands and say, hey, how was your day? How's the aircraft running? And just get that field experience so that when you are licensed and you're out there, you're ready to rock and roll. Uh, that's, that's an important learning curve. Yeah. Can you, for the folks that aren't familiar with that process, can you talk about the apprenticeship process and how that translates into the AME world? Yeah. So you, they come out of school. We normally, and we sign them on for a full apprenticeship. And uh, what that does is with our ATO, we're able to give them a long ranger and a 407, C30 and C47 or a FADEC course in-house. So they start with their apprenticeship. We normally start them in Kelowna or one of our bigger bases, then transition them out to one of the operational bases. And at the operational bases, you don't get as much maintenance. But what you get is when the pilot comes in during the day, hey, I got this going on. You learn to talk to them and you learn, you learn all those processes. And then with about eight months to a year left, about a year to eight months, we put them on our type course. So now they know why they're fixing it. Now they know how the systems go. And then when they're licensed, you know, they do their in-house tests. And when we kick them out the door. They're ready to go. That's nice. cool. Yeah. And uh, we've had great success. I think from the company standpoint, that's a big part of your internal recruitment process. I mean, if these folks are coming to your, to your company, seeing the culture that you've created and like, wow, this place is, it's awesome. You know, this is somewhere I want to stay. I see that as a big benefit for you guys in the long run. Yeah, it was um, for... Kind of at, right after COVID, the amount of apprentices we were getting, normally they're lined up at the door. They weren't there. Mm. They, they weren't coming. And so I reached out to a couple of friends uh, who are instructors and they, they made appointments for us. And we put up poster boards at the school. Hey, we're coming. Come join our team. And, you know, we had to go sell it. Yeah. And feel free uh, to feel free to plug it right now, dude, because hopefully some of them are listening to this one if they're, oh, if they're coming yeah. out of the school. Right. So. Yeah, matter. no, it's uh, it's great. So actually, it's interesting. Is I didn't expect to get ten good apprentices, okay. and so now we got to kind of slow down a little bit to like, okay, we got to get these ones going down the funnel, and uh, hopefully get a couple more next year, and just keep keep on going internal recruiting. What's the head count there in the shop? There, how many do you have in the back now? Uh, I think we got sixty-seven AMEs. Okay, something that comes to mind, and this is this is off script, I think entirely. So we can edit this out if we need to, but um, having the amount of aircraft that you guys operate and then also operating in, in these really kind of uh, extreme environments with altitude and, and weather and all the things that go with that, I could see there, there being a high risk for 
a, a critical mishap. Can you talk about your role as as a DOM and kind of preparing for such a thing? If if one were to take place, if you've been through an incident like that, can you talk about what people might expect? And if not, maybe some steps that you guys have taken through your safety protocols to kind of prepare for something like that. Almost like a little bit of counseling. Yeah, yeah, that that's there. I went through an extreme incident in Papua New Guinea that, that kind of prepared me for that. We lost an aircraft. We'll talk about that first. And uh, there was a multitude of errors and we couldn't find it for five days. Wow. And that was a long time. And mm-hmm. uh, the lessons I learned from that, I, I empower. There was already a good culture where I'm at. Um, we, we have a huge uh, safety protocol that goes in pilot. There is no cap on pilot training. There's mm-hmm. none. If you need more training, you're getting more training. There, there's mm. there's no cap. And uh, this past winter, the, the chief pilot and the safety officer, who's also the pilot, they flew around in a long range and just flew with everybody mid season. Just just how you do. Let's go, let's go, let's go do some laps. It's important. And once an incident happens, it's very easy uh, to, to take the human element out of it and just deal with it. But that's not the right way to deal with it. Because people are upset and people will, will react. Everybody reacts differently. And and somebody might be just absolutely terrified inside and they're not showing you. Mm-hmm. And you need to remove them from the situation, not to do more harm for them long term. And uh, and just really just deal with it uh, the best you can at the time. And there's no you can't train for every incident. Right. Um, I, I think of these incidents and I think what's most what what invokes the most fear oftentimes is is the unknown. You know that there's going to be an investigation. You know all the logs are going to be dug through, and you know that they're going to be looking for a cause. And I think whether you're a pilot or a mechanic, the fear is that it was caused by you. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and you're trying to work through that mentally. So, being that you've been through that, uh, what what was some surprising parts of that investigation that you might be able to help someone be like, hey, this is something to expect. And this is kind of maybe how you can prepare for it a little bit. You, you, you know, it, it goes back to being professional at your job. Me, okay. You know what? And I'm going to go, I'm going to even take a step back and tell all the engineers, make sure you're not the guy at the bar at night. Have a beer and go to bed. Because if you have five beers and the pilot has an incident, it may reflect, they're going to look at you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And are you a professional or what are you doing? What's your scenario? What, you know, what are you doing there? And, uh, and if that, if an incident like that happens and you're there, take a step back. Don't rush out. How many times is there a second incident after an incident? Yeah. Because people rush out. You know, if, if the incident has happened, it's happened. It's already in play. It, just take, take a step back. Cause I always find when you take a step back and, uh, just breathe, it's pretty scary. Yeah, it really is, and right. uh, especially when it's your friends involved, and uh, you're you're including them by flying with each other. Scott is is massive, just like you say, just because it builds that relationship and that bond between the people that are kind of either turning the wrench or flying the helicopter. So yeah. kind of kind of having that practice in place, that's you kind of like it's telling you to kind of really give a shit. So it's yeah, it's, I mean it's, that's that's massive. I mean the old saying, the engineer creed. I mean that pilot's relying on for you to do a good job. That's it. We can talk about it, but you're there to do a job and things happen. There's, there's always that gray area where, where it could be a manufacturer flaw or something. But if you actually look at helicopters, it's not very often. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, it's a very low percentage and. Uh, yep. It's that we, we still, I know we spoke about this in a couple of episodes here and you know, you have people that really don't understand helicopters and they think that when an engine goes, you're done. I'm like, no, it's called auto auto rotate down, right? Like you, you show him videos. Ah, it's CGI. I'm like, no, no, no. That's just a good pilot. <laughs> he knows exactly what to do and how to do it. So, I think I think once you've gone through those incidents, I, I don't know if you have John or been around them, but you carry those for your life. Yeah. And um, and yeah, you, you try and impart that knowledge to people, but they have to want to have it. And, and my, right. my only advice is slow down and take a step back and be a professional. And talk about it there too. Like you, you've, you've struck the nail on the head a couple of times too. We really need to kind of talk more about situations that are, that are cause us that, that like for lack of a better term, that's it's PTSD that you're dealing with. And if you're not dealing with it, like if you're kind of really in compartmentalizing it within yourself, you're going to be at an argument with yourself and that's not a good place to be. So talk about it amongst your peers, talk about like get therapy, get help, or just, just voice it 
and get that get that uh, supportive shoulder, if you will, uh, from 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 the professional leagues that we're in. Yeah. Thank you to our sponsor, Precision Aviation Group. Mission critical operators and fleet managers rely on Precision Aviation Group as a worldwide leading rotor and fixed wing MRO provider. PAG provides tip to tail solutions in four MRO segments, avionics, components, engines, and manufacturing DER services. A single point of contact gives you access to over 150 million in inventory globally, 24 seven. Just call 800-537-2778. Precision Aviation Group. Others sell parts. We sell support. Yeah, I, I had an incident that wasn't an incident, and, and I learned a lot from it, is uh, the helicopter was overdue. And we're, we're heli scheme. This is 15, 18 years ago. And uh, on the radio, the radio dispatcher said, the helicopter's gone down. Scott, you need to get to the heli shack. I, I shit my pants, right? Like, yeah. What, what the hell? Like, what the hell? So I, I get there. I get in the rescue cache stuff going. I'm getting everything going. And I, I can hear it. It's coming. And it flies in. And the pilot gets out. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I had a problem with my loose pump today. And I'm like, so I go talk to the radio fella. He said, no, mm. the helicopter's down. I can't fly gas. I'm like, you don't say that on the radio. And, and that was a real learning curve for me to... When you go into a new environment, have a talk with the radio person. Make sure they understand what to say. Because yeah. my perspective, we had an incident going down. Yeah, it changes everything. Communication. It's the it's it's the pillar of success in everything that we do, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boy, oh boy. Luckily for me, I, I haven't been a part of a mishap. A uh, good friend of mine was. He was a, a pilot for Huntington Beach Police Department. They fly MD500s. And they were over a call just off Newport Beach, crashed. And unfortunately, the, the TFO co-pilot in that incident uh, perished as a result of the crash. And uh, we talked talk to RJ about that. He's been a guest on, on Hangar Z podcast and really get insight from him. He talks about, you know, the investigation that, that took place afterwards and the fact that, you know, the NTSB and the FAA are going to comb through basically the last 48 hours of your existence and, and scrutinize everything that you did. So like you said, if you're at the bar the night before getting, getting schnockered, Mm -hmm. you guarantee that's going to be a part of the investigation and it's going to be a potential cause for, for what happened. Uh, so, you know, and, and that's on the pilot side for, for you guys, what are you seeing as far as the investigation? What can people expect? How far back are they going to start looking and, and probing? You, you know, to be honest, Transport Canada, I haven't seen them do a lot of that. So, so where I'm at at Alpine right now, they got a, a super culture is the SMS investigator is there. They also sent out uh, two employees to do accident investigation. They did full, uh, they're fully trained. And every time we have an incident, uh, you know, with a major damage or whatever, he deploys with one of those guys and we investigated to find out what happened. We go through it all, but for Transfer Canada, I haven't been involved when they've dug into it too much. Okay. Um, or just haven't been exposed to that. Good. It's good to have someone in house there to kind of be, kind of be, kind of almost proactive looking at it at that at that point of view as well. I'm sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Transfer Canada. I mean, it's pretty tough for them if there's been an accident in the mountains. Like quite often, you're you're, you're in an avalanche. You can't go do an investigation. No, mm -hmm. no. You got to go sling that thing off the hill or whatever yeah. you need to do. You need to make it happen soon. Yeah, you're in a SAR mode uh, more than anything. That's right. Scott, this has been um, this this has been a lot we've covering here, brother. Like I said, I appreciate you kind of kind of walking down the line with us on this. Oh yeah, you're you're a man of positivity, and you're a man of with a bit of like I I look to you for a lot of a lot of good comments, and I I really appreciate your friendship and all that. When you're when someone's listening to this in their earbuds, and they're kind of going through this uh this you know phase of looking at do I become an AME or is, if I'm an AME do I become a DOM? What's your lasting piece of advice you want to kind of offer to them? Anybody coming up, ask questions and form your own opinion. As you come up in the industry, everybody tells you don't do this or don't do that. And I find you'll never be whoever told you to do X, Y, Z. You need to listen to everybody and find your own path and become your own person. And uh, that that's, that'll help immensely. And uh, you did ask that question. Just You got to close up. Anybody who's thinking of this industry, the world's your oyster. You know, 
You can go anywhere in the world. You can travel anywhere. You can see anything. You can hang out with the locals in Australia and PNG, Tasmania. I've done it. It's incredible all across Canada. And I can't think of a better career. Like it, it, once you're in, I don't think you can get out. <laughs> John, what have we said? Yeah, blood <laughs> what in, have blood we out. said in the past? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, like the, the, I met Val 10 years ago and we still BS and text back and forth. And I got friends all around the world. And, and yeah. uh, it's great. I sent I sent Scotty fishing pictures. Yeah. <laughs> and I sent him pictures of me fishing without fish. <laughs> you're right, though. The community is amazing. And yeah. I, it doesn't matter what part of the community you're in. It's one big community, you know. It doesn't matter what, what you're doing. Everyone's tight. And there's so much commonality when we hang out. It's blast, you know. So I, I love that part about it. I think so. that's kind of the... And again, I know we've said this in the past that everyone thinks our industry is so big, but it's it's really pretty small based upon the friendships and the relationships that we've kind of cultivated with each other. Because Scott and I talk mostly personal stuff when we talk to each other before we go professional. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only vendor that does that with Scott just because of his, just, just because of his kind of uh, his demeanor. And it's just like, it's like your, your cultural learnings that you've kind of brought into your role at Alpine and just amongst your guys, like you said, you got you got a head count there, buddy. And for you to kind of instill that into one of them and into every one of them is, is going to take some time, but at the same time, just know that you're doing a great job, dude. And you're, you're, you're a positive role model in more ways than one. It's unlike, even when you're, cause you have, you have two boys, two boys. Yeah. Yeah. So you have two boys and they're going to look at dad saying dad was a pretty cool dude. And at the same time, you know, they will never expose that to the, to us as, cause I got two boys as well. <laughs> And I know like they'll never say that to our faces, but know that you're doing a good role because it's you're you're setting a positive role as not only as a as a as a as a DOM, you're setting as a father and as a husband, right? So it's you're you're all along the good path, brother. Yeah, I appreciate it. The kind words, yeah. It's uh yeah, it's a great career. I appreciate you guys having me on the show. It was uh I don't even know really what we were supposed to talk about, but I think we went <laughs> through it. We covered we we covered some bases. We covered some bases, and more so just like I said, it's it's, this is, this is again, when we're, when we're I, to the people that are listening to this, it's to kind of get the stories of the individuals that are in their industry. They're pretty freaking cool. Like it's, there's, there's some, there's some characters that we all know that actually can kind of talk layman's terms when it comes to particular predicaments, particular situations, or even just kind of having a network available to us when we're in a pinch Co- count on your camaraderie, count on the camaraderie and whether your, your competition might be your friend still in the background if you're ever in a pinch call them up they might be able to help you out so yeah, yeah you know what i don't think there's an operator out there where i can't call the dom and have a chat to them about right. a particular thing like you've done it for me personally like you know when, when when i had customers calling me up looking to kind of get information on the drive shaft and i know you've offered your name for his, just a, just a just a brief con, you know consultation if you will just to kind of get these people talking about what was involved in starting, you know, installing the, the aft firewall to the drive shaft and so on and so forth. So th- thanks for that. So like oh, yeah. when I, you know, I tell people that my network is your network and that's, I, I mean that. So thanks for kind of being a part of that. Yeah. No, it's all good, man. It's been awesome. And you talk about a career full of adventure and I think you probably have the most unique story that I've heard, you know, on, on any side of the mission set. You know, talk about running from cannibalists and, and Papua New Guinea, even though I made that part up, might be a you little bit You made that part up, but it sounded good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you've traveled all over the world and, and worked on helicopters and flown in helicopters and, and probably the most beautiful places you could possibly be. We think about that and, and it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So it's been an honor to, to sit and talk with you and thank you for imparting your knowledge on, on me and, and the industry as a whole. It's been been really cool. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. I yeah. got one last question for you, buddy. It's the way I've ended my show from everything every, from the day that we started. <laughs> and this, you know, I hold you in pretty high regard. So, I've seen you drink, I've seen you eat. Does pineapple belong in a pizza? Seasonal. It's seasonal. Mm, I've never heard that answer. No, that's the first. Summertime, you're having some nice drinks. You're outside. You're at a wood fired bakery. They got craft beer. You can throw some pineapple on that. It's summertime. <laughs> Okay, you know, winter, you're gonna I'm go not. heavy meat load. And cheese. <laughs> hey, that's how this that's how this temple was built. <laughs> Seasonal. That's the first. That's the first for our show, John. Never heard that. Yeah, that's I'm the not, first for a joke. Not gonna say I agree with you, but I will say it is a unique answer. Yeah, it's it's a unique <laughs> angle for sure. I'm 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 not. Yeah, I'm kind of with John on that. Like, okay, good for you for having that, but okay, seasonal. <laughs> I'll I'll take it. Next time you're out in Kelowna and it's 37 degrees. 
we're down at one of the crap breweries and they bring it out, you're going to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because you know why? There might be a video camera of me eating it when I question that like it shouldn't be on pizza anywhere. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> Scott, absolute pleasure, buddy. You're a legend. You're a good man. You're a good friend. Thanks a lot for being a part of this Vertical MRO show here. I'm, 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 like I said, we're, we're honored to have you on and finally get you on and talking about it all. So I can't thank you enough, brother. Excellent. Well, thanks, guys. To that note, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. I uh, hope you're having a good day. And this is rocking in your earbuds. Thanks for kind of jamming out with us. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. All right. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Stand by for a message after a word from our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsor, Bell. Bell proudly supports the Vertical MRO podcast and their vision to share valuable insights into helicopter maintenance, repair, and overhaul. Bell is dedicated to keeping our customers in the sky and on their missions with industry-leading global customer solutions. Thank you to our sponsors, Safe Structure Designs. Safe Structure Designs specializes in custom aircraft maintenance stands and hangar equipment, boosting hangar efficiency by 50% and enhancing technician safety. With over 20 years of experience alongside real-world aircraft technicians, SAFE develops industry-leading ergonomic safety solutions. Why not take advantage of SAFE's free custom design process for your safety and efficiency needs and let them create your ideal solution? Visit www.safe-2.com to learn more. Thank you to our sponsor, Precision Aviation Group. Mission critical operators and fleet managers rely on Precision Aviation Group as a worldwide leading rotor and fixed wing MRO provider. PAG provides tip to tail solutions in four MRO segments, avionics, components, engines, and manufacturing DER services. A single point of contact gives you access to over 150 million in inventory globally 24 seven. Just call 800-537-2778. Precision Aviation Group. Others sell parts. We sell support. And that brings us to an end of another enlightening episode of Vertical MRO. We've had the pleasure of speaking with Scott Hayward, a director of maintenance, PRM, industry expert, and more importantly, a good man and friend. He has shared invaluable insights into the world of aviation maintenance and leadership with a little snapshot of his life in the industry. From restructuring and modernizing the maintenance department to implementing strategic initiatives that ensure safety, efficiency, and continuity, Scott's expertise and innovative approach have truly set new standards in the industry. His ability to navigate the challenges, foster communication, and drive continuous improvement is a testament to his exceptional leadership. Thanks for letting us, the Vertical Helicast team, into your world and appreciate you listening to us bringing you these great guests. I'm Val, and on behalf of John and our team, thanks for listening. And may your skies be blue and clear and your rotors turning. This is Vertical MRO. Val, over and out.